Perfection is not a state of being, it is a state of striving. The journey is all that has meaning, not the goal. To be the best version of yourself, is this not a goal shared by all of mankind? To eliminate your flaws and suffer no more? However, hindsight can often be a bane of these ideas or choices that you make in life. And perhaps this sentiment is echoed heavily by the Primarch Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children. It was not one momentous occasion that led to his current form, but a lifetime of choices and outside influences that has created the Demon Primarch. His story starts being stolen away from the genetic facilities upon Terra by foul entities of the Immaterium. As his capsule was being hurtled through the warp, its destination was to a planet in the Asan subsector of the galaxy, to a small feral world called Chagoris. It was a fertile world with wide open green plains and tall white mountains and blue seas. However, it clearly was not meant to be, as before the capsule could reach its destination, its trajectory was changed. The gestation capsule was swapped with another, with the Primarch that would become Jagatai Khan by something outside of the influence of the Four Powers. It is not confirmed who this mysterious meddler was, but the result was now that the young Primarch of the Third Legion was hurtled towards the planet of Chemos. The young Primarch's gestation capsule crashed on this destitute mining world placed in the Ultima Segmentum. Unfortunately, life on Chemos could only be better described as survival. Cursed with lifeless deserts and barren wastes, devoid of flourishing life, said to be illuminated only in perpetual twilight. The existing human inhabitants of Chemos began as miners. They colonized the planet during the Dark Age of Technology over 5,000 years prior, though unfortunately with the Age of Strife nearly all progress was lost. Humanity on Chemos over generations had begun to progress. The entirety of the Chemosian people had to work nearly every hour of their solar day, perpetually maintaining resource synthesizers and working in the nearly depleted mines. Day in, day out, sweating away in the dark, damp and stuffy conditions underneath their fortress factories. You could imagine the effect on the human population of this incredibly harsh daily routine. It left no time for luxuries such as arts, philosophy or even any basic idea of fun. You were considered lucky even if you made it to the old age of 30, if either the crawling work or starvation hadn't taken you first. In this place that had seemed stagnant for so long, an inbound capsule falling from the sky would soon change their fate. In the 29th millennium, scouts venturing out from the fortress factory of Kallax discovered the crash site of the fallen gestation capsule. Clearing through the dust and wreckage, they discovered an infant boy, a perfect little boy who had descended from the very sky and had survived the impact to the surface. Maybe this was a miracle. The scouts begged Kallax's leaders to spare his life, as orphans were routinely discarded so that they would not burden resources. Looking into his perfect purple eyes, they truly believed that the boy was special. The boy was spared, and he was given into the hands of one of his rescuers, a member of the caretakers to raise as his own, a truly unheard of decision to a Chemosian. The man gave the child from the sky a name, Fulgrim. Kallax's society was ruled by an oppressive patriarchy who stood at the very top and the Primarch Fulgrim began his life at the very bottom of Kallax's society. Being a child did not matter on Chemos and he began to work down in the mines and resource synthesizers, working day and night to pay back the tithes he owed to his society. Covered in dust, bruises and blisters were a daily routine, but Fulgrim learned quickly and began to grow fast. It was becoming very apparent that he was different, or special. After working with the resource synthesizers for years, he began to contemplate their improvement. He began modifying and upgrading the technology through his inbuilt genius in his Primarch genetics. The more he improved the technology, the better life was for the people around him 
who he had seen slave away their own lives. The people began to trust and have faith in this young man, enough to make him an executive at the age of 15. As an executive, he learned the fate of Kemos and the state of the decaying world. Seeing his community and world suffer, barely knowing any comfort in life, Fulgrim decided that he would save them and his world. The planet's fate had changed. Under Fulgrim's direction, the teams of engineers travelled far from Kallax to the other fortress factories, reclaiming and repairing. Mining production skyrocketed as resources began to pour in. Kemos's mines were actually producing a surplus for the first time in decades, allowing the world to begin to purchase food and other needed materials in larger quantities from passing traders. The planet had begun to transform with the emergence of new cities, nature, and revamped colonization. Through various political marriages, Fulgrim was now the recognized planetary leader, and the people experienced the re-emergence of Kemosian art and culture, the luxuries of life that were denied him and his people, that he had given them through his hard work. The better he was as a warrior, leader, philosopher, artist, the more people around him flourished, the more he purged weakness from himself, the more he lifted up humanity. He had worked from the bottom of his society to the top, and the one at the top should be nothing short of perfect. The progress of the mining death world had not gone unnoticed, nor the story of a unique human uniting an entire planet. Fifty years, and the Great Crusade had reached Chemos, and golden eagle stormbirds descended from the sky, humans draped in ornate, beautifully crafted armor, like a shining beacon of excellence led by a being of an immense aura and magnitude. These strangers were invited to Kallax to meet with Fulgrim, and as he took one look at the being before him, without a word he dropped to his knees. The man's presence filled him with hope and pride. This man was a truly civilized and refined pinnacle of human potential. Stood before him was his father, the Emperor of Mankind. Maybe for the first time in his life, Fulgrim saw, in his own opinion, perfection. Fulgrim returns to Terra with the Emperor to meet the third legion of Astartes that had been created from his own genome. But Fulgrim learns to his horror that an accident called the Viral Blight had destroyed the majority of the gene seed that had been cultivated from his DNA. Without the access to their Primarch, the third legion had been stuck as a pitiful 200 marines, barely even a company, rather a legion. A sense of guilt and insecurity came over Fulgrim, as this blight, this weakness, was his fault. Nevertheless, without hesitation, Fulgrim addressed the 200 warriors, seeing in their faces the struggle that resonated with him and Kemos, having lost so much, but yet unbowed and enduring. Fulgrim bellowed out to his 200 sons as if they were a full legion to take the first steps on the journey to the betterment of mankind, that he would raise up mankind just as they had been raised up, that they would become the shining beacons of the future. To them, he gave the sacred task of bringing the Emperor's wisdom to all the stars in the sky. You are the Emperor's chosen, his heralds, his warriors, his children. For this is only the beginning. Fulgrim, just like his homeworld, had united his legion through words, his promise to give them utopia, to give them the best versions of themselves. With Fulgrim reunited with his sons, the rebuilding of the Legion began, with recruits from Chemos and Terra preparing them for the Great Crusade. Having been surrounded by the average mortal men his whole life, 
He was now faced with men like him, his brother Primarchs. Amongst all of the twenty Primarchs, it was said that there was no closer bond than between Fulgrim and Ferris Manus, the Phoenician and the Gorgon. Though this bond grew over centuries, it was even said that they formed an instant connection upon their first meeting. This initial encounter occurred upon Terra, beneath Mount Narodinia, at where Ferris Manus was busy toiling with the Forge Masters who had once served during the Unification Wars. The Primarch of the Iron Hands had been demonstrating his phenomenal skill and miraculous powers of his liquid metal hands when Fulgrim and his elite Phoenix Guard had descended upon the sprawling Forge complex. Both were like gods unto the terrified artisans, who prostrated themselves before these two mighty warriors, as though fearing a terrible battle might ensure between them two. Fulgrim had declared that he had come to forge the most perfect weapon ever created, and that he would bear it in the coming Great Crusade. Of course, the Primarch of the Iron Hands could not let such a boast go unanswered, and he had laughed in Fulgrim's face, declaring that such pasty hands could never be the equal of his own living metal appendages. Fulgrim accepted the challenge with regal grace, and both Primarchs had stripped to the waist, working without pause for weeks on end, the forge ringing with the deafening pounding of hammers, the hiss of calling metal, and the good-natured insults of the two demigods as they sought to outdo one another. At the end of the three months' unceasing toil, both warriors had finished their weapons. Fulgrim had forged an exquisite warhammer, Forgebreaker, that could level a mountain with a single blow, and Ferris Manus a golden-bladed sword, Fireblade, that had forever burned with the fire of the forge. Both weapons were unmatched by any yet crafted by man. Upon seeing what the other had created, each Primarch declared that his opponent's was the greater. Without another word spoken, both Primarchs had swapped weapons and sealed their eternal friendship with the craft of their hands. Anyone who looked upon the mighty weapons could feel the power radiating within, and know instinctively that more than just skill had gone into its forging. Love and honour, loyalty and friendship, death and vengeance. With one of the greatest weapons by his side, Fulgrim was now focused entirely on his responsibility to the Great Crusade. Fulgrim had seen how much humanity could rise up on his homeworld, and was it not the right thing to do to bring all of this to the scattered remnants of humanity? Within this Imperium of Man under his father, humanity was saved from the trappings of religion and poverty. They could indulge in the luxuries denied him in his early life. Because he had experienced a life without these things that we take for granted, he knew their value more than most. In a way, he had a duty to experience all of these luxuries to become a more perfect being. The better, wiser, and more refined he was, the better he could help the rest of humanity. Fulgrim was anxious to begin his conquest of the unknown regions of the galaxy as part of the ongoing Great Crusade, but realised that his forces were not sufficient numbers. The Emperor asked Primarch Horus to mentor his brother Fulgrim and his legion. Before the Third Legion was reunited with their Primarch, they had served as the role of champions in the Imperial Army due to their low numbers, the superhuman warriors amongst the ranks of mortal men serving as battle-hardened duelists and leaders, but never truly in the formation of an Astartes legion. So it was that for over a solar decade, the Emperor's children and the Lunar Wolves fought side by side, the bond of brotherhood and trust forged in battle between Fulgrim and Horus. They became unbreakable, as did the bonds between their legions. When the Emperor's children had finally built up enough numbers and strength, they set off independently of the 28th Expeditionary Fleet. Fulgrim was eager to prove himself. If he was to be the perfect guiding example to humanity and his father, he would need to prove it in swift, efficient conquest. 
After numerous successes and displays of masterful conquests, the Emperor's children eventually came to battle with the alien species known as the Leia. Described as a snake-like lower body with insectoid heads and multi-limbed, Although, the Leia supposedly genetically and chemically modified their bodies to better suit their tactical environments. The Leia altered and modified themselves to become their idea of a perfect race. The war with the Leia inflicted heavy losses for the Third Legion, due to Fulgrim's promise to shorten the timeline of the conquest from decades to a mere month. During the closing hours of the conflict, Fulgrim and his legion pushed to the last stronghold of the Leia at their grand temple on the island of Laeron. Strange energies of the temple began to affect the Emperor's children, clouding their minds like an unnerving feeling of sickness. Through the thousands of losses of the Third Legion, they pushed through this last bastion and discovered what the Lair had fought to the death to conceal. Fulgrim's eyes gazed upon it, a tall silver sword with a gently curved blade and a crude amethyst gem set in the pommel. A finely crafted blade fit for a king. He could see it. The reward for his impeccable strategy, his legion's hard-fought victories. He did not know why he felt so strongly, but he had to have it. Fulgrim claimed the blade as his own, though this was no ordinary blade. As sealed within was a greater demon of the chaos god Slanesh. The demon within began whispering in his mind and slowly corrupting his soul. Over the years of the Great Crusade, he began thinking the whispers in his mind were only his subconscious thoughts speaking directly to him. The whispers began small, almost a mimic of any person's inner thoughts and feelings. It might have started as subconsciously having deeper grand delusions of himself and reflecting upon past events differently. Seeing himself now, he began to see the chasm between him and mortal men widen, for he was a superhuman warrior and an expert in all pursuits. For a man who had dedicated himself to self-improvement for others, he was beginning to do it for himself. In turn, this slow corruption began to influence the Third Legion, as they strive to live up to the ever-increasing standards of their gene father. Creative and martial pursuits of the Legion will be pushed further and further each time over the next decades. The Legion would strive further towards their goal of perfection, ever distancing themselves from their own humanity. Each time some new sensation was explored, it left them desensitized and desperate for that same high. At a pinnacle point during the beginning of the 31st millennium, Fulgrim met with the legendary Eldar Farseer Eldrad Ulthran of Craftworld Ulthwe. The Farseer pleaded with Fulgrim and revealed that Horus had been wounded by the chaotic artifact known as the Kinnebranch Anathame. The mortal wound had allowed the chaos gods of the Immaterium to corrupt the War Master's soul, despite the intervention of Magnus the Red. Fulgrim's philosophy was that only humanity were capable of his version of perfection. He viewed Xenos distasteful and lesser than. The Xenos before him were accusing one of his most beloved brothers, his family, of being tainted. This must have filled the Primarch with unbelievable rage. His anger was further fueled and stoked by the Leia Blade. It wanted the Primarch to reject Eldrad's words and it led Fulgrim to launch an unprovoked attack on Eldrad. After this pointless slaughter, the Eldari sorrowfully withdrawed. The Eldar had proven themselves treacherous and liars. Fulgrim listened to the whispers in his head. In his rage, he ordered the destruction of several beautiful Eldar maiden worlds using virus bombs. The Demon Blade's influence was showing, guiding him to send the Eldari traitors to their graves or in reality, to the embrace of Slanesh. Seeking answers for the Xenos' filthy accusations, Fulgrim sought an audience with his brother. Reuniting with Horus, he demanded answers, but was met with a proposition. A carefully crafted speech to turn Fulgrim to his side. 
Fulgrim's admiration for Horus allowed Chaos to find its way deeper into his heart. All of Fulgrim's life he had pursued perfection and beauty, things denied him and the people of Chemos. This may have left him feeling entitled to it. With his judgement weakened by the years of use of the layer blade, all Horus had to do was deliver the right words to the brother he knew so well. Words such as the Emperor holds us back, he does not care for humanity, he is the only obstacle in the way of your perfection. Going from the pursuit of perfection in all things to ultimate depravity isn't a journey anybody takes in one step. It is a series of small ones, each one justifiable in its own isolated way. But after you've taken a hundred of those small steps, you're a long way from who you were at the start. With these two centuries at war, Fulgrim had changed. His legion had changed and they were entirely focused on achieving perfection for themselves. This meant eliminating those in the way of that path, even their own brother Astartes. The traitor legions began the horrific purge upon the world of Istvan III, disregarding the noble and loyalist Astartes. Legends such as Rylanor and Sol Tarvitz, warriors who exemplified the old ideals of Fulgrim and the Emperor, Fulgrim showed complete disregard for soldiers that had served with him for centuries, because his view on perfection had been twisted. With this diseased arm cut off the body of the legion, as temperance was discarded and their indulgences ran rampant, Horus had shown him the truth of the Immaterium, and the third legion would bathe in its power. This led on to the infamous performance upon Fulgrim's flagship, the Pride of the Emperor. The event was prepared. Famed composer Bekwa Kinska prepared her ultimate masterpiece to be performed for Fulgrim and all of the assembled Astartes of the Emperor's children. Afflicted with Slaneshi corruption, Kinska created new musical instruments for a performance piece worthy of a Primarch. The performance began to disorientate the audience and rose to a fevered frenzy throughout the ship. The twisted song crescendoed and the music summoned five lesser demons of Slanesh, known as Demonettes from the Warp, who possessed the bodies of Kinska and several of her singers. This reached a fever pitch of divinely performed madness. Such an experience of excess must have felt like a reward to Fulgrim, reaffirming his decisions. It was during this performance that the Emperor's children finally gave themselves over, both body and soul, to the Prince of Pleasure. The Dropsite Massacre is an almost incomprehensible in its proportions of death and destruction to the average person. Ferris and Manus have been tasked to bring the traitors to heel at the head of the Loyalist host. As the first waves of troops crashed against each other, thousands perished every minute. There was truly no turning back for the Third Legion, as they held the centre of the traitors' line. Soldiers that had fought side by side throughout the galaxy and had formed deep bonds of friendship and brotherhood, had shattered that trust. Feelings of betrayal and hatred would rise to the surface on both sides, and would fight with fury never seen before. The scale of the conflict would have been overwhelming to the masses of fallen bodies, so thick it was almost impossible to wade through. The Third Legion would fight day and night, head on against their previously closest brother legion, the Iron Hands though now the sight of the Third Legion would have truly shocked the Loyalist forces, as they had begun to embrace the more physical aspects of Slaneshi corruption. Driven by anger or grief, or perhaps both, Ferris had made a direct charge to confront his brother alongside his elite Morlocks. Fulgrim began to taunt his brother, treating it like a game. As the Loyalists were being slaughtered, Fulgrim must have felt arrogant and superior. As the tide began to shift, 
He must have felt that he had proved him and his legion superior. The two Primarchs traded violent blows, wounding one another deeply during that fierce struggle. As Ferris pushed himself to his feet and staggered towards the wounded Fulgrim, he cried out as he brought the flaming blaze towards his brother's neck. The Fulgrim lashed out as he drew this single-edged, demonically possessed sword. With Slaneshi corruption pouring from the blade, diabolical strength flooded Fulgrim's limbs as he pushed against the power of Ferris Manus. Feeling his brother's surprise at his resistance, Fulgrim managed to surge to his feet and struck out, his layer blade biting deep into the breastplate of Ferris's armor, and the Primarch of the Iron Hands cried out, crumbling to his knees once again. Fulgrim had proved that he was the better warrior and raised his sword above his head. His grip was locked onto the weapon ready to strike. Then he froze. Why? Why was he trying to kill his closest friend in the galaxy? He looked around him and saw warriors that once held great respect for each other, fighting to the death. Was this perfection? Is this what he had envisioned on Chemos, dreaming about raising humanity up? Why did Fulgrim want to be perfect so badly? Perhaps because inside, in truth, he thought so little of himself. If he was perfect, he would not feel shameful, weak, and most of all, insecure. The future that Horus painted was almost too good to be true, and now he realized that it was. As this realization dawned on Fulgrim, he saw out of the corner of his eye Ferris reaching for his fallen sword. Fulgrim's blade seemed to move with a life of its own as it swung down. Fulgrim tried desperately to pull the blow, but he was no longer in control. The demonic blade sliced through the genetically enhanced flesh and bone. The Iron Hand's Primarch fell to the ground, his head separated from his body. Fulgrim looked down at his brother's lifeless body, and his mind became shattered with grief. His brother, his friend, the person he was closest to in the universe, the one person that understood him. But Fulgrim had thrown it all away and betrayed his brother because the idea of perfection had become more important. Truly shocked with what he had done, it's likely that he had lost completely the will to live. At this point, the voice that he believed to be his subconscious told him to let go, that he did not have to bear this burden. The layer blade that he had taken in all those years ago spoke directly to him and offered him escape. Fulgrim is shamed by what he has done and agrees to the demon's request. The Slaneshi demon takes control of his body and seals his consciousness inside a painting, freeing himself from the guilt of his own actions. A murderer, betrayer, tainted, and an enemy of the Emperor. All things Fulgrim would have never dreamed of becoming. But with the combination of the layer blade and his choices, this was the path he had chosen. Now with the layer blade demon parading around in his body for years as the Horus heresy raged on. His soul was trapped inside a painting that resided in his flagship showing a shocked expression of horror and sadness. But this was not the end for the traitorous Primarch, and he was eventually able to escape his prison and swap places with the demon reclaiming his body. There are hints that during this time Fulgrim's consciousness, or soul, experienced what could be the realm under Slaanesh's control in the warp. Recovering slightly from the shock of the events upon Istvan V, he would have realized his predicament. A prison inside a painting was not the freedom from burden and guilt he felt for his betrayal. Unwilling to be trapped there forever, he must have searched for a way to free himself. Unfortunately for him, he was a Primarch of the Emperor, a most valuable prize to the Chaos Gods. 
Perhaps he was offered the power to escape his prison, to truly escape these feelings of guilt and weakness. What if he could be given the power to become the pinnacle of perfection, to be rewarded with pleasures that he deserved? It is stated that when he reclaims his body, he explains to his legion that he had learned of Warpcraft and the infallible ways of demon kind. He eventually was able to use his newly acquired arcane knowledge to force the demon out of his mortal body, swapping places with the foul entity and trapping it within the portrait for all time. Usually, for someone to learn something, they have to be taught, and the price of the knowledge and power he needed to free himself was absolute corruption. It is clear that the Fulgrim who returned from the painting was not the same that he had embraced chaos, and with his new knowledge of the universe and warp craft, his idea of perfection had changed. He would achieve perfection for himself, for only he chosen of Slanesh was worthy. As the Horus Heresy progressed, Fulgrim enacted his plan for achieving perfection, and soon joined forces with Perturabo, Primarch of the Iron Warriors. Promising a worthy prize, the two joined forces on a quest to tip the balance of the rebellion in Horus' favour, as they journeyed into the Eye of Terror to retrieve a weapon known as the Angel Exterminatus. Shortly before they were to leave, Fulgrim uncharacteristically gifted his brother an amulet known as the Maljata Stone. They soon landed on a crone world of Yidris. The Empress' children and the Iron Warriors had to contend with an army of Wraithguard and Wraithlords that had awoken from a deep slumber to defend their home. At the height of the brutal struggle, Perturabo noticed that he had lost sight of his brother. This sent feelings of uneasiness, and he pushed further throughout the Eldar Citadel to pursue him. But soon arrived in a massive spherical chamber, and Fulgrim revealed to his brother that there was no Angel Exterminatus, but rather he was to become the weapon of mass destruction. Betrayed by his brother, Perturabo attempted to attack Fulgrim, but felt his body fail and slumped to his knees. Fulgrim had activated the Maljata stone that Perturabo wore, absorbing his very essence. Now with the Iron Warrior's Primarch's power in hand, Fulgrim revealed the full purpose of his plan. He was going to achieve apotheosis. He would sacrifice his own brother and evolve into a demon. The heretical ritual was initiated. However, Fulgrim's moment of glory would not go uninterrupted, as an ambush of Salamanders, Iron Hands, and Raven Guard, who had been stalking the traitorous fleet in search of vengeance since the drop site massacre. The loyalist Astartes charged at the traitors, and during the crossfire they shattered the Maljata stone. Perturabo grasped his warhammer and looked to his brother. He saw no remorse in his brother's eyes, only sadistic joy. Anything left of the noble man Fulgrim was gone. Perturabo raised his warhammer and struck his brother. Fulgrim's body exploded under the impact of the warhammer, and the cry of release was a shrieking scream. A violent explosion filled the air with a blinding light. What began was a rebirth in fire and hate. Every eye in the chamber was turned to the center. Through the warrior's slitted fingers and shimmering reflections, the survivors of the fighting bore witness to something stunning, yet haunting. An agonizing death and violent birth combined. A figure floated in the midst of this light, and it took a moment for Perturabo to realize the impossibility of what he was seeing. It was Fulgrim, bare and pristine, his body unsullied by any flaws. Fulgrim's back arched and his bones split with gunshot cracks. His flesh, once so perfect, now ran fluid and malleable. His form molding and remolding as though an invisible sculptor carved and molded him like clay. Fulgrim's legs extended and lengthened, fusing together in a writhing serpent's tail. 
the skin thickening and sheening with reptilian scales and segmented chitinous plates of body armor. Fulgrim was human no longer, but twisted into a vile creature that resembled the Laeron he destroyed decades ago. A form that was stronger, faster, and no longer bared the burden of human guilt and insecurity. Fulgrim the human was dead replaced by Fulgrim, the demon Primarch. Fulgrim was dead. Long live Fulgrim the demon prince of Slanesh. His new corrupted and disgusting form reflected the heart within, where once he had sought to raise up humanity as he was raised, now he only saw a chasm between the perfect being he was and the weak imperfect humans. The corruption of Slanesh had twisted anything it touched, rewarding his worst impulses and excesses. He cared little for the material universe, instead immersing in the intoxicating powers and pleasures Slanesh offered, and he would have stayed if it were not for Lorgar of the Wordbearer's Legion, attempting to assemble the traitors at Ulanor in preparation for the final drive on Terra. However, not all of the traitor primarchs could be found, nor were they all obeying the summons. Thus, Lorgar proposed that Perturabo journey to find Angron while he sought out Fulgrim. Using an oracle disciple named Actea as a guide, Lorgar, Layak, and a small force of wordbearers entered the webway in search of Fulgrim. They successfully navigated its treacherous corridors to enter the Eye of Terror, where they eventually entered the realm of chaos and soon found themselves before the palace of Slanesh itself. Within, they discovered Fulgrim and the demon Nakari engaged in debauchery. Fulgrim refused to leave his delights and return to the war effort, forcing the two sides to battle. As Lorgar held off Fulgrim, Layak uttered the true name of the newly ascended Emperor's Children Demon Primarch, a true name being a focal point of Demon's very power and existence. Fulgrim was bound to Layak's will by the name's utterance, and after a gathering of the desperate Emperor's Children together, the two legions arrived at Ulanor for Horus's muster. With the traitor legions united, they headed directly for the solar system, the heart and capital of the Imperium, where Horus laid siege to Terra itself. Now fully corrupted, the Primarch and his legion ran across the planet as an undisciplined band of murderers, committing acts of debauchery and cruelty words can't even describe reveling in the excess and pleasures it gave them. Humanity had suffered greatly, and its very existence was hanging by a thread. But through great sacrifice, humanity prevailed, killing Horus and ascending the traitorous legions on a desperate retreat to the Eye of Terror. Thousands of Terran years after the events that had occurred during the Horus Heresy, a trio of heretical Astartes from the Thousand Suns Legion, Murshid, Akhtar, led by the Chaos Sorcerer Malin Vistario, were dispatched by their demon Primarch Magnus the Red from the Planet of Sorcerers to investigate a distress signal that came from a long dead world. Investigating deep inside the long abandoned caverns, Vistario spotted the shattered outlines of an ancient contempt to Dreadnought. Dust and ash lay thick on its adamantium sarcophagus. The colour of his arm was all but obscured. As the Thousand Suns approached the Dreadnought, it reawakened. After conversing with the injured Dreadnought, they came to the startling realisation that the war cracked a dead world above them was none other than Istvan III, the site where the Warmaster Horus had murdered the Loyalists from his legion and first revealed their allegiance to Chaos. The Dreadnought was none other than ancient Rylanor, a legend of the Third Legion. 
Vistario deduced that Rylanor had managed to reshape the sonic weapons into a distress beacon of some kind, but the Dreadnought chuckled at the ignorance of Vistario's observation. For the device was no mere distress beacon, it was a lure. When Vistario asked what the device was intended to lure, a silken voice answered. For me, isn't that right, Rylanor? The device had been modified to draw the demon Primarch Fulgrim back to Istvan III. Without warning, the demon Primarch suddenly appeared from the shadows. Rylanor was horrified and disgusted by his former gene sire's appearance. The Primarch was an abomination to him, a perversion of the once master and father of the Third Legion. The demon Primarch mocked the ancient Dreadnought's damaged appearance. Fulgrim asked the Ancient of Rites why he had summoned him to this long dead place. The Dreadnought managed to push his carapace upright into a sitting position, revealing the object that had lain beneath it for millennia. Humming power cables ran from Rylanor's sarcophagus to an opened control panel. Vistario felt his blood chill as he finally understood what it was an armed warhead of an unexploded virus bomb. Rylanor had lured the demon here for this, and his betrayed brother's vengeance, and activated the trap. Unfortunately, the Thousand Sun Sorcerer produced a psychic kind shield in order to contain the explosion. Enraged, Fulgrim attacked Rylanor, enhanced by his Slaneshi gifted powers, fast as Quicksilver, he cut into the outer case of the Dreadnought's carapace. Reaching within, he breached Rylanor's sarcophagus and reached out what was left of the legionary's mortally wounded form. Fulgrim offered Rylanor the opportunity to return to the Emperor's Children Legion and accept the gifts of the Dark Prince and walk by his side, clad once again in flesh. He could be anything as the demon Primarch had the powers to sculpt him into any form he desired. An offer perhaps he himself was too weak to refuse. Rylanor roared his defiance. Never. All we have left between us is that we will die together. I am Rylanor of the Emperor's Children, Ancient of Rites, Venerable of the Palantine Host, and proud servant of the Emperor of Mankind. Beloved by all, I reject you now and always. Two sides of the Emperor's children. A dichotomy between the ideals of the Fulgrim of old versus the fallen demon. The honour and defiance of Rylanor resonated with a thousand sons, and without a word between them, they detonated the warhead. Once more, all life was burned away upon Istvan III. This was not enough to kill the demon Fulgrim, but was by far an inner victory for all of the betrayed. Primarch Fulgrim was once on a noble and worthy path, but ultimately it was a combination of his worst tendencies and outside corruption that ruined his perfection. Would you, in his shoes, have chosen a different path? Have you ever looked at yourself, your flaws and weaknesses, and wished to overcome them? Maybe if you were perfect, you would have no shortcomings, no insecurities, no pain. What would you give to escape pain? For the corruption over the years of the Great Crusade, it became a degradation of his character and life. Are you not an amalgamation of your memories and experiences? What if something changed how you viewed your past? What if it turned and warped those feelings of kindness and determination into jealousy and desire? What if all of this led into the consequences that felt like a living nightmare or living hell? For those that dwell in hell, what reason do they have to refuse salvation? 
Unfortunately, the choice was made, and Fulgrim became the epitome of the worst version of himself. Jealous, prideful, cruel, a debauched demon. Just like the father, the sons fared no better, as they followed him into Slanesh. At the point of the 41st millennium, Fulgrim and his legion are fully immersed in the lifestyle of excess. Due to the nature of chaos itself, the unity of the Emperor's children was never really possible. We find that the Third Legion is split into warbands, roaming the galaxy, committing atrocities in search of any unexplored sensations or the favour of Slanesh. More often than not, they are in conflict with the other traitor legions as they compete for artifacts, sacrifices, or the attention of their cruel, sadistic deity. As his fellow space marines lost themselves to corruption, we find one of Fulgrim's sons, Fabius Bile, on his own independent, yet dark path. Bile had left Holy Terror shortly before Horus's defeat at the hands of the Emperor, accompanied by a handful of his most gifted acolytes. Bile's warband moved through the war-torn Imperium on a journey of research into the depths of genetic manipulation. Wherever he strode, the rogue offered his assistance in exchange for prisoners and genetic samples. Despite his blasphemy, Bile still adhered to a twisted version of the old imperial truth, believing that only the foolish and weak sought out the comfort of gods like the ruinous powers, and that the pursuit of scientific truth was to be held above all other values. This is perhaps the influence of the doctrine of the old Third Legion. However, genocide and genetic debasement marked his path, and his hubris led him to even attempt to clone the Primarchs. Before the start of the 41st millennium, we rejoin Fabius Bile as he revisits one of his many abandoned laboratories. Sifting throughout the dust and the wreckage and the piles of rubble, he finally makes his way through the facilities, examining for salvageable materials. He finally happens upon a tank. As he examines, he takes notice of the movement within, and as he looks closer to examine the tube, he sees a child with perfect features and purple eyes look back at him. A clone of Fulgrim. This version of Fulgrim, unlike all of Abile's previous attempts at recreating his sire, was an exact copy, as pure as the original before his corruption. Why this clone of Fulgrim succeeded is a complete mystery to Fabius, and it baffles him. The cloning tank cracked, and Fabius Bile caught the infant into his arms, his feelings conflicting within him to the Primarch he remembered, and the demon that existed now. Fabius spared the boy, and the new incarnation of Fulgrim aged to maturity rapidly, as he had before. Some years beyond this event, Fabius Bile was hunted by an Emperor's Children warband that sought revenge upon the Clone Lord. In stark contrast to the honourable legions of the past, the warbands are nothing but twisted and corrupted Astartes, rifed with mutation. As the warband forces push upon Bile, they are stopped dead in their tracks, as they find that they are set upon by a looming human figure. As they aim for the kill shot, the traitor marines cannot do it. As to their horror, they see Fulgrim, their Primarch, covered in rudimentary armour bounding towards them. The traitors cannot comprehend that a human Fulgrim is before them, and almost can't believe their own eyes. The Primarch bellows out to his sons to stop. He reveals that he's not just Fulgrim but Fulgrim with all of his memories from the Great Crusade and heresy. He was filled with the pain of his sins, his murder of Ferris Manus, his betrayal of the Emperor, and mostly, his betrayal towards himself, at least who he used to be. Underneath the influence of the Leia Blade and Horus could have been the champion of all of humanity and its greatest supporter, its Phoenician. The cloned Fulgrim spoke passionately to the warband, condemning his demon counterpart, 
and vowed to lead his third legion on a better path. Instead, before he could undertake any of these actions, Baal betrayed his creation into the hands of the Necron Overlord, Trazen the Infinite. Perhaps Baal feared this new Fulgrim would diminish his power. Perhaps he hated the sense of loyalty in his heart to his gene father, or for that all the clone Fulgrim's passionate denouncement of his demonic counterpart's actions, this Fulgrim truly was the same man and would end up making all the same mistakes and poor choices as before. The resurrected Primarch became a part of the Necron's collection of important historical figures on his tomb world. The future for this Fulgrim is bleak. One path a repeat of the same mistakes that led to damnation, or a slow road to redemption in the eyes of the Imperium. Perhaps the legacy of the man Fulgrim is not unredeemable. Perhaps there are some in the Imperium that could take back the honour of the Third Legion. Perhaps a loyal Phoenician would need loyal sons in his long road to forgiveness and the destruction of the enemies of the Imperium of Man. Though trapped in stasis, perhaps there may come a time for the Phoenix to rise again.